The Law of Self-Defense content you are about to enjoy is presented for general educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. If you are in need of legal advice, consult competent legal counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. Hey folks, welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense content. I am, of course, Attorney Andrew Branca, Forward Law of Self-Defense, and today I'd like to share with you seven demonstrably true facts surrounding the Ahmad Arbery case that would appear to provide considerable context around Arbery's deadly charge at Travis McMichael on February 23rd, 2020, resulting in Arbery's death, but seven facts which the jury in the trial of Travis McMichael, his father, Greg McMichael, and neighbor and amateur videographer, William Roddy Bryan, the jury will probably never hear these seven facts before arriving at verdicts in this case. Now, you'll recall that Ahmad Arbery charged Travis McMichael after Travis and his father, Greg McMichael, had stopped their pickup truck in the street some distance from Arbery, with Travis standing outside the truck's driver's side door. The event was being filmed by neighbor William Roddy Bryan on his phone as he followed some distance uh, further behind in his own vehicle. The reason for the pursuit of Arbery was the belief of the three men that Arbery might have just committed a felony burglary of a local home under construction located at 220 Satia Drive. All three men have been charged with various degrees of murder and other felony charges, and their trial begins tomorrow, October 18th, 2021, in Glynn County, Georgia. Although it is those three men, and obviously not the deceased Arbery, who are on trial for purposes of convenience, I refer to their trials as the Arbery trial. As a reminder, I will be closely following the proceedings of this trial in real time as it occurs over at the website Legal Insurrection and doing an end-of-day legal analysis in plain English of each day's events for your reading and educational enjoyment with that end-of-day analysis available right here on YouTube and elsewhere. Also, you can always find all our coverage of the Ahmad Arbery case, past, present, and future, over at our own website, Law of Self-Defense, by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash Arbery. That's A-R-B-E-R-Y. So let's get back to the seven demonstrably true facts surrounding the Ahmad Arbery case that the jury will never hear before arriving at verdicts in this case, or at least probably never here. With respect to each of these seven pieces of evidence that I'll share with you in a moment that the jury will almost certainly never see presented at trial, the defense is arguing that the evidence is relevant to understanding the totality of the circumstances that led to Arbery charging Travis McMichael on February 23rd, 2020, and fighting Travis for control of his shotgun. In opposition to these motions to admit this evidence, the state is arguing to varying degrees either that the evidence offered is irrelevant to the legal issues around self-defense in the case, or if relevant, are so prejudicial that they should nevertheless be inadmissible. Now, technically speaking, the state opposes the introduction of these seven pieces of evidence using what are called motions in limine, or motions asking the court to limit the admissibility of certain evidence. And many of the relevant motions in limine by the state and responding motions by the defense are embedded throughout the text version of today's content, which again, you can find at lawofselfdefense.com slash arbory. Okay, let's dive into the seven facts apparently having relevance to the totality of the circumstances of the death of Ahmad Arbery which the jury in this case will probably never hear at trial. The first of these was that Arbery was a convicted thief. Uh, As just one example of Arbery's theft activities, on February 6, 2018, Arbery entered a guilty plea to the offense of felony shoplifting in connection with his attempt to shoplift a television from a Walmart. We even have police body camera video of Arbery's arrest in the parking lot in this instance. I will embed that in the text version of today's content, which again, you can find at lawofselfdefense.com slash Arbery. This theft conviction uh, can also be found referenced in the defense motion In response to State Motion 4.71, you can find that State Motion 4.71 and the defense response embedded below fact number three a little bit later in this content. Now, with respect to this demonstrably proven 
uh, history of Arbery's theft activity, specifically this uh, felony shoplifting charge and conviction, the trial judge in this case has prohibited the defense from mentioning this or presenting this evidence at trial. So the jury will never hear of this felony shoplifting conviction. The second fact that the jury probably will never hear is that Arbery was a convicted felon also uh, on a separate charge for unlawful gun possession at a school, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. So in 2013, Arbery was found guilty of felony gun possession on school grounds, as well as three counts of felony obstruction of an officer for his violent non-compliance with arrest that resulted in injury to officers in that case. As a result of these convictions, Arbery was sentenced to five years in prison, but then permitted to serve that sentence on probation. Uh, Again, that felony conviction can be found referenced in the defense motion 4.71, which is embedded in fact number three a bit later in this content. Again, the trial judge has ordered that evidence of this conviction will not be admissible in court. So the jury will not hear that Arbery had a felony gun conviction for which he was sentenced to five years in prison during the trial of this case. The third fact that the jury probably will never hear before arriving at a verdict was that Arbery was on felony probation on the date he died. So unexpectedly, Arbery's shoplifting conviction, described already, uh, resulted in the revocation of his probation for the gun conviction, uh, also already described. But nevertheless, for whatever reason, Arbery was back out on probation, felony probation, on February 23rd, 2020, the date on which he charged Travis McMichael and was shot dead in the physical struggle that followed. Now, the state has filed a motion in limine to prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery being on probation uh, when on the day he was killed. Um, and of course, the defense has objected to the state motion trying to get this evidence excluded. So the state's motion in limine trying to get this evidence of Arbery being on felony probation the day he was killed Uh, The motion attempting to exclude that evidence is embedded in the text version of today's content, as is the defense response to the motion, saying the evidence should be permitted in front of the jury. And although I don't see documentation of the trial judge making a final ruling on the admissibility on this evidence of probation, as of the moment I'm making this content for all of you, based on prior rulings on similar evidentiary issues, I expect that the trial judge will indeed prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery's probationary status at trial. The fourth fact that the jury probably will never hear before they arrive at a verdict in this case is that Arbery was high when he charged Travis McMichael and fought for the shotgun. A comprehensive and powerful chemical test of Arbery's blood conducted on July 14th, 2020, found the presence of substantial levels of THC, the active ingredient of marijuana, in Arbery's system. Now, interestingly, a less comprehensive and less powerful blood test conducted shortly after Arbery's death, some months earlier, had mistakenly come back negative for the presence of drugs of abuse. And the state intends to introduce that first blood test at trial as evidence that Arbery was not intoxicated with drugs commonly associated with aggressive behavior at the time of his death. At the same time, the state has asked the trial court to prohibit the defense from introducing the results of the more comprehensive and powerful second blood test that came back positive for THC in Arbery's system at the time of his death. Again, the state's motion in limine attempting to exclude this positive marijuana test result is embedded in the text version of today's content, as is the defense response, arguing that the THC positive test should be presented to the jury at trial. And once more, although I don't see documentation of the trial judge making a final ruling on the admissibility of this THC marijuana evidence as of the production of today's content based on prior rulings on similar evidentiary issues, I expect that the trial judge will indeed prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery's THC intoxication at trial. The fifth fact 
that the jury will probably never hear before they arrive at a verdict in this case is that Arbery was literally off his psychiatric meds when he charged Travis McMichael and fought him for the shotgun. People close to Arbery had been noting his deteriorating mental condition in the years and weeks leading up to his death on February 23rd, 2020, including even his probation officer, who in 2018 had ordered a mental health evaluation of Arbery as a result of these mental health concerns. There is evidence that Arbery described to his mental health evaluator that he had auditory delusions that compelled him to rob, steal, and hurt people, leading him into combative behavior and anger that led to difficulty for him both inside and outside his home. Arbery, as a result of this mental health evaluation, was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, which is often characterized by uncontrolled violence, aggression, and poor impulse control. Consistent with these violent characteristics of this disorder, in June 2018, Arbery's own mother had called 911 to report that Arbery was withholding her car keys from her. She cautioned the 911 dispatcher that Arbery's mental condition had worsened over time. She also cautioned the responding police officers that Arbery might get violent due to his mental illness if they tried to arrest him. Arbery was subsequently prescribed psychiatric medication, specifically Zyprexa, uh, the trade name is Alonzapine, in an effort to control his schizoaffective disorder. The blood test performed after Arbery's death indicated absolutely no detectable Zyprexa in his system at the time of his death, meaning he was literally off his meds, non-compliant with prescribed psychiatric medication, on the date he charged Travis McMichael and fought for control of the shotgun. The state has asked the court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence of either Arbery's psychiatric disorder, as well as of his non-compliance with prescribed medication to control that disorder, and the state's motion in limine to exclude that psychiatric evidence and non-compliance with prescription medication is embedded in the text version of today's content, as is the defense response to the state's motion in limine on this evidence. And although I don't see documentation of the trial judge making a final ruling on the admissibility of this evidence as of the production of today's content, based on prior rulings on similar evidentiary issues, I expect that the trial judge will indeed prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery's noncompliance with his prescribed psychiatric disorder or of the psychiatric disorder itself. The sixth demonstrable fact that the jury will probably never hear before they arrive at a verdict in this case is that Arbery frequently used jogging as a cover to facilitate or excuse theft activities. So as examples, on August 21st, 2018, Arbery was observed and body camera recorded in a neighbor's backyard looking into her car windows. When police approached Arbery afterwards, to give him a trespass warning, he falsely claimed that he had simply been running in the street. He then became aggressive and confrontational with the officers, threatening that he would whip the officers ASS if they didn't leave him alone. For whatever reason, he was not arrested for that event. On October 23rd, 2018, Arbery was confronted trespassing inside a mobile home by local deputies. Arbery fled when approached by police, and when later caught, he again falsely claimed that he was, quote-unquote, just out running. In 2019 and 2020, Arbery was repeatedly seen attempting to enter neighboring homes through their windows. Whenever confronted in the act, Arbery would take off running. Also in 2019 and 2020, local convenience store owners began to refer to Arbery as the jogger for his repeated conduct of running up in front of convenience stores, going through stretching motions, and then entering the convenience store to seize items, and then running quickly back out to flee with the stolen merchandise, to flee on foot. So the defense motion to admit evidence of Arbery's jogging as cover and excuse for his theft activities is embedded in the text version of today's content. Although I don't see documentation of the trial judge making a final ruling on the admissibility of this evidence 
as of the production of today's content. Based on prior rulings on similar evidentiary issues, I expect that the trial judge will indeed prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery's modus operandi of using jogging as a cover to facilitate and excuse his theft activities. And the seventh demonstrable fact that the defense will probably never be permitted to present to the jury before they arrive at a verdict in this case is that Arbery had repeatedly cased the 220 Satilia Drive property for weeks prior to his death. So on October 25th, 2019, surveillance video at 220 Satilia Drive captured Arbery at night and in the dark inside the property, presumably canvassing the property for valuables. On November 18th, 2019, surveillance video again captured Arbery at night and in the dark canvassing the 2020 Satilia Drive property, presumably for the same unlawful purpose. On February 11th, 2020, surveillance video, this time accompanied by eyewitness accounts and 911 recordings, once again captured Arbery at night inside the 220 Satilia Drive property. And of course, on February 23rd, 2020, the date that Arbery would be killed, fighting Travis McMichael for control of McMichael's shotgun, Arbery was in flight from having again trespassed into the 2020 Satilia Drive property again, as captured on surveillance video and presumably observed by others, thus initiating the pursuit of the fleeing Arbery, and again presumably for unlawful purposes, constituting felony burglary under Georgia law. And to touch back on this whole jogging modus operandi of Arbery, his family would later characterize his flight on foot from this presumptive felony burglary on February 23rd as mere recreational jogging. Each of the trespassing burglary incidents just mentioned can be found in the 1.14 motion that's embedded in the text version of today's content. And although, again, I don't see documentation of the trial judge making a final ruling on the admissibility of this evidence as of the production of today's content, based on prior rulings on similar evidentiary issues, I expect that the judge will indeed prohibit the defense from presenting this evidence of Arbery's serial prior trespasses into 220 Satilia Drive, presumptively for unlawful purposes and thus constituting repeated acts of felony burglary of that property under Georgia law. Okay, folks, so to wrap up, those are seven demonstrably true facts surrounding the Ahmad Arbery case that would appear to provide considerable context around Arbery's deadly charge at Travis McMichael on February 23rd, 2020, resulting in Arbery's death, but which the jury in the trial of Travis McMichael, his father Greg McMichael, and neighbor William Bryan will probably never hear before arriving at verdicts in this case. And remember, I will be closely following the proceedings of this trial in real time as it occurs over at the website Legal Insurrection, right out of Cornell Law School and doing an end-of-day legal analysis in plain English of each day's events for your reading and educational enjoyment, with that end-of-day analysis available right here on YouTube in video form and, of course, elsewhere. Also, you can find all our coverage of the Ahmad Arbery case, past, present, and future, over at our own website, Law of Self-Defense, by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash arbery. Okay, folks, that's all I have for you on this topic. Remember... If you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill, that's why I carry a gun, so I'm hard to kill, my family is hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so that you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.